Greetings and welcome to the Savage Gav. Today, I will be talking about the wild cards. George R. R. Martin, I've never read his Game of Thrones series, and this is the stuff that I know him for. And he didn't write very much of this. He and Melinda Snodgrass, who also worked on Star Trek, uh, The Next Generation, I think she edited season two and three, the story editor, and she also wrote a number of episodes. And I think one of my favorite ones of hers is A Measure of a Man. Uh, a lot of the other ones are pretty good as well. Worth checking out anyways. And she did some stuff for The Outer Limits and whatnot. And we all know who George R. 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 Martin is, so I don't need to talk about him. Uh, anyway, so these guys, apparently, back in the 80s, they played role-playing games. And one particular one that George Martin and Melinda Snobgrass played with other friends who were also apparently writers was Wild Cards, which is a game they made up based on rules. Anyways, you can find out which rules they were, but based on rules. How about I, uh, that's them there. And so they, they, they played these games and there was this thing called Thieves World, which was this shared world um, universe, like, Marvel Cinematic Universe, MCU, whereas this, they decided to make the WCLU, which is the Wild Card Literary Universe. There you go. Uh, I prefer TLAs myself, three-letter acronyms, but, you, you know, you get what you give them. So anyways, uh, they got together and they decided after playing this game for a year and that they, they really fleshed out these characters and made them, they decided that they were gonna make a shared universe. And George McMartin approached the people who did Thieves World and they had figured out how it worked, how this shared universe concept worked pretty well. Um, they knew the pitfalls, they knew what not to do, how to manage it. And so that's what they did here is, is and it was a smoother, a lot smoother and it's, it works really well. They did this and there's a bunch of other books. They did this one here and this is number three. Yeah, number three. And they did this one here. So I'm gonna talk about those. There is a lot of wildcard books. I think they're up to 28 or 29 at the moment. I sort of paired it out around about the 16. And I'm actually keen to get back into it. I'm reading Juices Down at the moment and it's, it's the juices are flowing again, whatever that means. I'm enjoying it. What I do like, and I think most other people would like, um, is that that one, like, like this first four, is historic in nature. Wild Cards universe veers drastically from ours in 1947 when Tachyon, Dekesian something something something, his name's like 20 words long, comes to Earth in his spaceship, baby, and he you know, says he's come to save the world and stop a horrible virus from being released. And so on Tachys, which is their planet, they have been generating this virus for, you know, for generations. Like one in a hundred people become aces, one in ten people become jokers and everybody else dies. So like, you know, one percent survival rate or one in ten of the survivors become aces. Who knows the math, but you know, something like that. And there's aces and there's deuces. So the aces, they are gifted with a power. Um, every, all the powers come from this virus. Um, it, it recurs a couple of times. And the aces, a lot of their powers do relate to like subconscious things. Um, anyways, there's lots of different powers and even robots and aliens. And so yeah, it's a, it's a really fertile universe. And then there's juices, which are guys which have a power, but it's, you know, you know, you might be able to open bottle tops with your thumb or something, you know, something Wow, cool power, but not really. And then there's the Jokers who are like hideously transformed um, or, you know, they've got, they've turned into bugs, they've got eyes or, you know, there's something physically changed about them. But otherwise, they're just normal people that look really different. And then there's a couple of aces, uh, Jokers that are aces as well. It's a good premise. Number one. Okay, so the bottom one is the Lizard King. 
and on the top is the golden boy and I'm pretty sure that's the 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 black ace that gets that falls down and again Tachyon. And it kicks off in 1947. They've got a, a whole suite of authors. They had Roger Zelazny early on in the piece and other great writers. Uh, plus, I think George R. R. Martin writes some as well and Melinda Snodgrass writes some too. And in fact, she writes some of my favorite ones. In this book, they sort of, they go through 1947. Jet Boy, Save the Day. This is written in 87. So this is kind of, I think, um, the Rocketeer was out and would have been um, Alan Moore, you know, so so the so comic environment was changing and these writers grabbed a hold of that and they pushed this out. And this is great because as I said, historic. Um, it goes from just after World War Two with, with Jet Boy who fails in saving New York City and the virus is released over New York City. So New York City becomes like the epicenter for all things wild cards. The virus, you know, is caught up in like the winds and it flows all over the world. So every country has jokers and aces. Um, you know, Russia kills all of its jokers and takes all of its aces and no one wants to be a wild card there. And then into the Cold War and there's a, there's a fear of not only of Russians, but of jokers. Um, apparently Stalin becomes a joker. I've got to figure out what sort of joker he became because that's kind of interesting. Uh, and so you get gradually the characters that they've created being released. Let's go through this. So 30 minutes over Broadway, uh, Walter Waldrop, and that is the story of Jet Boy failing to stop the release uh, the wild cards virus. And he never got to see the Jolson story. Well, Jolson sings again. I, um, the Sleeper, which is Roger Zelazny by the Amber Corporation. Uh, so that must be, yeah, Princess of Amber. That's a good story. I like Croy, he's a recurring character and he's, he's, he's a good, he's a really good character. Um, Witness, can't remember, Degradation Rights. Shell Gains, which is the origin of the great and powerful turtle, who's really cool. Transfigurations, Science of the Wild Cards Virus, Excerpts from Literature by Victor Milan. His stuff's really good. It's like these little vignettes, newspaper articles or reports that kind of flesh things out and explain how the wildcard universe works, which is, which is, yeah, they're good. I quite enjoy his stuff. We have The Long Dark Night of Fortunato and Epilogue Third Generation by Lewis Spiner. And I like Fortunato, like pimp, Doctor Strange kind of mental powers. He was a dude, he's cool. And his villain, the astronomer, is a really good, solid bad guy. And he sort of gradually percolates through the background for the for these first four books. Really, really good villain. Um, and lots and lots of great side characters. You can, the world is really rich. Um, you can tell that they had all these characters from games and they don't even necessarily appear in the books, but they're kind of like in the background. So there's all these other heroes, you know, like the Howler, there's Peregrine who sort of, she sort of, pops in and out occasionally. The Dark Shadow who doesn't appear until much later. Um, and so so they had these characters set up and they're mentioning them throughout the, throughout the narrative, even if early on, because this kind of goes through to the 70s even. And so they kind of almost throw in some of these later characters' um, stories. A bit earlier, they're sort of appearing. Um, you know, Hartman is, is there, Greg Hartman. So the characters that appear in number one are Jet Boy, Ace pilot, Wonder Boy, whose heroic sacrifice brought about the new era. Dr. Tachyon, the flamboyant extraterrestrial who came to Earth to defend it from his own kind. The Golden Boy, a football hero, an actor whose superhuman strength and power brought a meteoric rise and an equally rapid fall. He's a good character, like he's, a, he's good, I like him. The Black Eagle, the powerful thunder-throwing champion destroyed by the forces of fear in the hate-ridden 50s. Fortunato, whose dark talents were liberated by the erotic power of tantric magic. <laughs> Jesus Christ. The Sleeper, trapped in an ever-changing form. Puppet Man, who used his gifts to enslave. The great and powerful turtle, a mild-mannered ace who fought to become a true hero. So yeah. 
really that's the first book um Surrender yourself to wonder, excitement, and high adventure, and it delivers. It really does deliver. There is a secret history of the world, a history in which an alien virus struck the Earth in the aftermath of World War II, endowing a handful of survivors with strange superhuman powers. Some were called aces, gifted with extraordinary mental and physical abilities. Others were jokers, cursed with bizarre mental or physical disfigurements. Some turned their talents to the service of humanity. Others used them. For evil. This is their story. Here, in the first volume of an exciting new science fiction series, a dozen of the field's most gifted writers share in the exploration of this astonishing alternate history. It's good. Edward Bryant, Leanne C. Harper, Stephen Lee, George R. R. Martin, Victor Miles, John J. Miller, Lewis Shiner, Melinda M. Snodgrass, Walter John Williams, Howard Waldrop, Roger Zelazny. So, I, you know, and, and it goes on. So this sort of sets it up through sort of McCarthy era, Fear of Aces. And then we have number two. All right, so we've got Peregrine, Modular Man. The giant King Kong is actually another race who unfortunately <laughs> forgot he was a human and spent a long, long time as a massive ape. Apparently he can absorb energy and get bigger. And there was a blackout and he absorbed all the energy and turned into an ape and rampaged. Modular man defeats the ape. I don't know, aliens? Alien thing. I don't know what the alien thing is. And Peregrine. Aces High includes works by Lewis Shiner, Roger Lazasny, Melinda M. Snodgrass, Walter John Williams, Victor Milan, Pat Cadigan, John J. Miller, Walter Simons, and George R. R. Martin. And yeah, so this came out in 1987. So the characters that appear in number two are the great and powerful turtle, a re reticent ace with a heart of gold and a shell full of awesome power. The sleeper, the hibernating mercenary who wakes each time with a new body and and powers to match. Kid Dinosaur, a starry-eyed teenager boy whose strange powers earned himself a place in the action. Dr. Tachyon, the diminutive alien who has vowed to protect Earth from his own kind. Fortunato, whose experience with the erotic power of tantric magic unleashed his own dark talents. Chrysalis, though her skin is transparent, no one can see through to the mysteries she hides within. And Jube, the walrus who peddles Newspapers, and on the side, masterminds an attempt to save the human race. So Penny's from Hell, Fortunato chasing after the astronomer. So it starts in 79 and jumps to 85. Jube, he pops up throughout. Ashes to Ashes by Roger Zelazny. Another story of Croyd Crenson. Good stuff. If looks could kill. Ah. James Spector, so who becomes Demise, which is a really cool villain. Basically, he dies and he re comes back. He, re he has regenerative powers and he also is a telepath, but he can only telepathically transmit the experiences of his death. And he does that by looking people in the eye. And Dem eyes are killers. I only just realised that there was a silly pun there, like, recently. And I've read this, must have read this, like, tons. Like, I've read these these ones a lot. So, Walter Simmons. You're the dude, man. Well done. Good job. Great stuff. Is this got the swarm in it? Anyways, there's the swarm. Before the Vietnam exploded onto front pages, before Watergate brought an era of distrust, before the hippies told us all we need is love, there came the wildcard virus. From it emerged a new race of metahumans with extraordinary abilities who explored, survived, and shaped the turbulent decades to come. In this astonishing second volume, you'll meet the, those wild cards who ushered in the 80s and came upon a terrifying enemy from a distant world, which is the Swarm, which is a really, really cool bad guy. The Swarm. Let's have a look at number three, shall we? 
So number three, which is Joker's Wild. There you go. Um, and on the front of the cover, you can see Tachyon, as per usual. Um, that's the great and powerful turtle in his little VW. And that's Fortunato flying along there. And number three includes Vagabond. She commands armies of animals and can send them against predators, humans, and superhumans. Sewer Jack, hidden deep in his mind, is a monstrous reptile driven by a desperate hunger. I think he's a villain and he just ends up eating people, but he turns them into crocodiles first or something. It's... The Wraith, a meek, unassuming librarian. She can walk through walls. Roulette, she kills men with love. Fortunato, he uses the erotic power of tantric magic to liberate his own dark talents. Fat Man, he can command gravity itself. I don't remember him being called Fat Man. I think they just called him Hiram Worcester. Hiram runs Aces High, and a bit of stuff happens up there. I think um, some cool stuff happens with even Croy up there as well. He goes a bit crazy. And Dr. Tachyon, the diminutive flamboyant alien defender of the human race on Earth. As the nations struggle through four turbulent decades from the end of World War II through the sleek new wave 80s, the bizarre metahumans created by the wildcard virus use their extraordinary abilities to shape the course of history. Now, on the 40th anniversary of the original wildcard day, the streets of Manhattan erupt in frenzied celebration. Number four. Is that, I think there's Gimli. There is a dwarf called Gimli, I'm pretty sure. You got Tachyon, who's the dude. Um, uh, an Indian ace, I can't remember her name, that can turn into an elephant and fly, I think. And that's Ronald Reagan, Reagan up there. They're kind of cool covers. Let's find out who did the cover art. Cover by Richard Kriegler. Don't know the dude, but anyways. And number four, which is Aces Abroad. Oh, it's getting eaten by something. Oh, I've just got scratched. Aces Abroad. But anyways, it's just a bit beat up. Look, it's falling apart. Oh dear. Um, yeah, so let's have a look at this one. This wasn't, these three, this is, I think this is the best, the good place to start. If you want to give it a shot, there's really strong writing all the way throughout. Um, you know, the later books are great. Melinda Snodgrass is like the, the rocks and the jumpers is great stuff. Um, even when the one-off story set on Takis is really fun. Um, and it's just really well written. All the sort of the stuff leading up to the rocks was really fun. I think this is where my time. The first 10 to 12 books are very strong. Like it's worthwhile checking those out at least. And I understand the newer stuff is getting really good too. The middle, there, there was a period there where it kind of lost its way. Um, and I was sort of, I was said I was reading Juices Down and that, um, that, is about juices, which are the aces, which are not really aces. They've just got, you know, these rubbish powers. And that's jumping back in time again, which I think, honestly, like a superhero story set back in time, I think is really great because you can explore history through a new lens and have fun with it and explode it out, you know, blow the hell out of it. You know, superheroes aren't something that have just sort of really happened in the last 10, 15 years with the MCU. There have been cinematic and, and other shared universes where writers work together to create stories. Even Marvel and DC have done it. Image does it, you know, they're all the companies, you know, they grab their, they get their separate creators and they entwine them if they do a really good job. Like the Ultimate Universe did that with a number of crossovers. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And um, this, this really works. There's even what they call mosaic novels where like there's individual stories by people, but they explode them out and put them back together throughout the throughout the piece. So like, if you will, a film filmed by numerous um, writers and directors stitched together. Very, very, very cool. And as I said, they, George Martin approached the guys who did Thieves World and he figured out how, what they did. And it's almost like what, I suspect what Kevin Feige is doing with the Marvel Cinematic Universe, which is thanks to Melinda Snodgrass and George Martin, who had who took this, who also took it from somebody else. So it's kind of like the passing of the baton. Um, so this is nothing new, this whole idea of 
of people trying to coordinate a shared universe. And it, as I said, various levels of success, this works really well. Some of my favorite characters in the series, um, I did like the Black Shadow, he's great. He, he has, the Black Shadow isn't, isn't just one, a one note character. He, he's actually like, has a bit of a tortured back, background. He's a bit of a dark guy. He was made to be, to kill somebody at a riot in like the seventies and, and went into hiding. And that was Greg Hartman that did that. I mentioned some of the villains, Demise, really good. Mackie Messer, really good. Blaze, really good. Yeah, the jumpers are really good. And the, the jumpers, there's a whole story arc of, you know, jump the rich. Teenage hoodlums and stuff who have the ability to just mind swap into somebody's body and then mind swap back, but they can mind swap multiple times and so they can bounce people around. So, you know, a wealthy businessman finds himself in the body of a joker and, and you know, there's all kinds of interesting stuff happening. And it's, it's pretty cool. It's really well done. I would be interested to see that. Now, apparently, um, Hulu and then somebody else have uh, bought the rights or have the rights to this. And I'm interested to see where it goes. Um, I'm kind of interested to see if um, Melinda Snodgrass can kind of work in that space um, because she did, I think, like seasons two and three as a story editor. She, I, you know, I don't know how much of a guiding hand she had there, but I think good, did a good job. And, you know, we know George R. 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 Martin stuff works. And there's some, there's some names there. And apparently the more recent um, Wild Cards has some good writers in it as well. So, yeah, worth... It's, it's got some real possibilities, I think, this new TV show. Um, and, I mean, they've done numerous comics. Uh, I remember one from, like, the 90s or maybe the late 80s that sort of came out at the same time as this, I uh, can't remember who, it was some small publisher did it. Um, and honestly, it's, I, I, I don't know if, it, if Wild Cards translates very well into a comic medium. It's based on superheroes, which you think comics are superheroes, but it, it, it's, it's not. It's, this is like the, the content of this stuff is pretty mature. They touch on social issues, you know, some fairly detailed sex, there's some fairly fluid sexuality happening in there. It's adult fair, and I don't know whether you could water that down and turn it into a kid's comic. Um, you could try, but I mean, that part of the charm is that it's smartly written. And then there was a more recent one that came out with an outbreak, and now it's, I think Marvel's doing a comic as well. Uh, there's a role-playing game that they did. Um, superhero role-playing, it's kind of smash grab stuff from my experience would be kind of fun to play characters and this is this is grounded so these are actually like the characters are grounded so it's it is it would have been a real role playing game as opposed to just a hack slash type adventure so you wouldn't necessarily need to worry too much about the game mechanics in this one i wouldn't think because there, there's just so many great ideas floating around and so many things to explore and i spoke about this with one of my friends when i was at, at school who was right into comics. And he was kind of like my go-to person about, you know, what do you think of this? Is this okay? Um, and I said, oh, you know, I found this. What do you think? And he said, oh, you know, it's a bit boring. They've all got the same origin. And then I'm like, yeah, I guess. I never really thought how important to a superhero is their origin. Um, I know it's like an important part for a comic. I mean, Spider-Man gets bitten by a radioactive spider and he's suddenly spider -Man. How he was transformed into that is less important than him getting the powers, trying to capitalize on the powers, failing his his uncle, his uncle dying, and him realizing that that he his approach had been wrong. And you know that's that's kind of like that's that's the core of what Peter Parker is. And also at the core of Peter Parker is he's an everyday person which this is what these guys all are. Like there's, there's heroes and they're on the TV talk show, but that's kind of just stuff that's background noise to the actual stories. These are, these are people on the streets, you know, or in the gutter or like at the hard edge of things that are existing and getting through things. And it's not preachy. There's no kind of social agenda here that, you know, the bad guys are bad guys, the good guys are good guys. There's all kinds of crazy messed up shit happening. So it's good. You have aliens. <coughs> 
you have magic, which is basically like stuff we don't understand. So Fortunato, you know, taps into tantric, and there's the astronomer who does rituals and, and, and the like. But that all sort of funnels through their ability as a wild card, and not everyone can do it. So it's not a transferable skill. Or well, sometimes the wild card stuff is transferable, like the jumping. Um, but generally, they're all unique. And they, there's this article, as I said, that talks about where their powers come from and how it's sort of partly psychological. And the Lizard King has is Jim Morrison with a lizard's head and he can drink and do drugs like crazy. And some of the names are, are kind of, you know, are kind of funny, like Demise and um, who's James Spector, you know. So, that, so it's clearly sort of comic book stuff, but, but then it, it tackles real social issues. Wildcards, check it out. Or it might eventually make its way to TV and then... You'll know what I'm talking about. So number four, Aces Abroad. Oh, look at that. It's all, it's been scratched. Wildcards. As the nation struggled through four turbulent decades from what, the end of World War II through to the, the sleek new wave 80s, the bizarre metahumans created by the wildcard virus used their extraordinary abilities to shape the course of history. Now an investigative committee of wildcard victims sets out on a world tour to learn how aces and jokers are treated in other countries. In this fourth astonishing volume, here are some of the heroes you'll meet in the, as the wild cards travel from the jungles of Haiti to the Great Wall of China. Xavier Desmond, the unofficial mayor of Jokertown. I haven't mentioned Jokertown, so Jokertown is like, uh, there must be a Jokertown in every town. Um, and Jokertown is where the Jokers live. And, you know, they've got their own society because they are pretty much ostracised as like a ghetto. The gnats go in there and, you know, live it up and laugh at them. Horrible, but that's what they do. There's also a character, Yeoman, um, who is just a human, but he's really cool. He, and he, he's like, he, he's a bit like a Punisher type character. And he's out there killing off the bad guys, but he, you know, fights the swarm and stuff. So Peregrine. The winged beauty whose talent is to drive men sexually mad before flying away. Father Squid, the kindly pastor of the Church of Jesus Christ Joker, he delivers his moving sermons through the tentacles that hang over his mouth like a constantly twitching mustache. Fortunato, the handsome half-black, half-Japanese ex-pimp whose special powers depend on his sexuality. I forgot there was half-Japanese. All right, catch you later.